Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Dania Koja and I'm gonna be talking about the intubation of the neuro patient. So let's start with first things first. Who am I talking about? Who is this neuro patient that I'm referencing? When I say neuro patient, I'm talking about a patient who's having a stroke. Whether we're talking about a ischemic stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke, or subarachnoid hemorrhage. I'm also talking about patients with status epilepticus, patients with traumatic brain injuries, and patients with spinal cord injuries. Although the pathophysiology of the specific injury is pretty much different, it actually is really the same. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The group of patients that I'm not talking about are those with neuromuscular weakness or neuromuscular disease. Those are patients who are a whole other beast and they have a lot of extra considerations to talk about. So those are not my patients for today. So when we talk about intubating the neuro patient, who are the ones that we're gonna need to intubate? Well, I'm sure you all know this really, really well. But let's just go over it real quick. While there are patients who are apneic, that's quite obvious, right? This is your super emergent intubation. A lot of the stuff I'm gonna talk about don't apply because you don't really have time for that in this patient. You just go, you intubate, and you go for it. The patient I'm gonna talk about is actually our biggest chunk of those patients who are the semi-urgent, semi-emergent intubation, where you have the luxury of a few minutes to prepare for that the best that you can. Those are the patients with a low Glasgow coma scale. Patients where you think, okay, well, there's an impending herniation. Or patients who you think that they have presumed worsening or expected worsening. Those are the patients where you know that they have a basal or stroke that's really bad, but they haven't lost their consciousness yet. Your subarachnoid hemorrhage patients where the CT looks horrendous and they still look fine for now. You still need to transfer them out to have that EVD placed and you know that they're going to keep increasing their ICP and get sicker with time and so on with a lot of other patients. Your bleeds that are going to get larger, you know that they're going to get worse. So you want to intubate them before that happens. Now, what happens when people actually injure their brain? Like I said, a lot of the pathophysiology at the core is the same. You have your vascular neuronal injury from whatever it is that happened, that stroke, the bleed, the injury, and then you have the ischemia and the free radicals. What that causes is a lot of edema, a lot of increased ICP, and decrease of the cerebral blood flow, and that leads to secondary injury. You're asking, you're looking at me and saying, okay, well, why are we talking about this? The reason is that the secondary injury is something that we can worsen, especially when we intubate or when we manage the patient around that time. And this is the one thing that we can actually affect and change to decrease this vicious cycle. So what are these secondary injury things that can happen? Things like seizures and edema, right? And worsening injury. But how do we make it happen? It's things like increase in blood pressure, decrease blood pressure, increase oxygen or decrease oxygen to your hypoxia, and your hypercarbia. Again, those are things that can very easily happen around intubation, so we gotta be really careful with that. You gotta keep in mind that intubation is dangerous because you can worsen that secondary injury. And the problem is that these patients are more likely to have this peri-intubation hypotension and have all these bad outcomes, why? because a lot of these patients have concomitant cardiac injury as well, in addition to their neuro injury. So how can we stop these things from happening? Well, the first thing is ask yourself, do they really need to be intubated? And if not, then just let them be. The second thing is that you're going to do things before the intubation, during the intubation, and after the intubation. So you have to prepare really well for this intubation to avoid worsening their injury. So how can we do that? So before are things like pre-medication and a couple other things. The first one is elevating the head of the bed. We all know that for patients who are neuro injured, we need to elevate the head of the bed to decrease the likelihood that their ICP is gonna increase. So in these patients, make sure that the head of the bed is elevated until the absolute last moment that you need to actually intubate them. The second thing is pre-oxygenation. Let's make sure these patients do not drop their oxygen. I'm not going to belabor this point, but whether you like to do apneic oxygenation, however it is that you like to do your pre-oxygenation, make sure you do that in those patients to avoid that detrimental hypoxia. The second thing is the pre-medication. So for pre-medication, one of my favorites is actually fentanyl. Fentanyl can be used as two to five micrograms per kilo. So if we're kind of doing a little bit of math here, for a 75 kilo person, that's 150 to almost 400 micrograms, which is a lot more than what we usually think of of fentanyl when we're intubating patients. 
The reason we use this large dose is that this dose blocks a sympathetic response. So it blocks a tachycardia and the hypertension that happen when we are actually intubating a person and irritating their airway with a laryngoscope. And that is actually what we want. Another medication we've often talked about before for medication is lidocaine. Lidocaine is often used in a dose of one to two milligrams per kilo. And the idea is that it blocks sympathetic response. Same thing, decreases the hypertension, increases the tachycardia. But that's really just a theoretical thing because there's no current evidence as evidence by these systematic reviews that were done like a decade apart. This stuff comes from tumor literature, brain herniation literature, not your average like RSI literature. So maybe not lidocaine. So remember, before you intubate, elevate the head of the bed, pre-oxygenate, and pre-medicate, preferably fentanyl, maybe not lidocaine. So what can we do during the intubation to actually make it better for this patient? So we have either induction agents, a neuromuscular blockade. So we'll talk about that. For induction agents, let's talk about propofol. We tend to love, love, love propofol, or maybe that's just me. Propofol is usually dosed at one to two milligrams per kilo, and it's fantastic because it decreases the ICP, which is what we want. But it also really decreases your blood pressure. And in patients who are already hemodynamically unstable, that can cause perintubation hypotension in around 30% of people. And that's not really what you want. Although it is an anti-epileptic, which is also a fantastic thing, propofol may not necessarily be your first choice on its own. And if you do, then maybe you want to start with a lower dose. So maybe a quarter or half of this dose and make sure the patient can tolerate that. And of course, if you can, just optimize their hemodynamics first. The second medication I want to talk about is ketamine. And unfortunately, ketamine has gotten a really bad rap when we talk about neuroinjured patients. So ketamine is dosed at one to two milligrams per kilo. And it is actually have a theoretical risk of increased ICP. The problem is that it's a theoretical risk of increased ICP. In a systematic review, the review of pretty much all of the literature that talks about this, patients are actually going to have either a stable ICP or in one study, they actually decrease their ICP. So this whole increased ICP from ketamine is not actually a thing. And these patients are going to have an anti effect because of the ketamine, and it's quite stable on the blood pressure. So actually, ketamine may be the medication you want to reach out for. A lot of us are familiar with ketofol, right? So ketamine and propofol, where you basically mix half of the doses of each and give that to patients. And that may be one thing that you want to reach out for. That is, in true, what my favorite medication would be in patients who are coming in who are neuroinjured. You get the best of both worlds. However, it does add a little bit of complication with dosing there. So just keep that in mind. Another medication for induction that we tend to use is midazolam. Midazolam is dosed at like 0.15 to 0.3 per kilo. Yeah, it's great because it has antiepileptic, but it really lowers your blood pressure. It doesn't really have a lot of other fun things to do. So maybe not midazolam, especially since we don't tend to reach out for it that often. And finally, etomidate. Etomidate is good. It's okay. You can use it at 0.2 to 0.3 milligram per kilo, which is your usual doses, and it doesn't really have any effects on the ICP or the blood pressure. So it's not really harming you, but it's not really helping you. If that's what you have and that's what you're used to, then great. But if you can reach out for any of the other ones and your patient can handle it with their hemodynamics, let's do that then. All right, so let's talk about neuromuscular blockade. With neuromuscular blockade, unfortunately, I am not going to solve the very long-term debate between succinylcholine and rocuronium. However, I will share with you some pros and cons for each so you can use whatever you are comfortable with. With succinylcholine, you do have a sophistication and that may actually increase your um, ICP a little bit. The other thing is that it may cause hyperkalemia. So in your patients that's been seizing for a while that you're considering that they have rhabdo, then maybe that's not the right patient to use this then. And finally, remember that it is short acting, which is kind of a good thing if you want to make sure that the patient's has a neuro exam afterwards that you can reassess them and do that, especially if you're at a center where you don't have an EEG. Now, how about rocuronium? Rocuronium does have a little bit of a delayed onset that makes people unhappy. However, if you use it at 1.2 milligrams per kilo, then that delayed onset is really negligible when it's compared with succinylcholine. The problem with it though is that it, it's intermediate acting, so it can last for a long time. So if your patient needs to be reassessed, you're going to lose their exam for a long time. Yes, it can be reversed, but we don't necessarily all have access to that. So just keep these things in mind and remember, 
there's not one that's ultimately definitely better than the other. There's a lot of studies that say more mortality with this and more mortality with that. At the end of the day, choose what you're comfortable with and know the pros and cons. So that's what you can do during the intubation. Decrease the time, so get your expert first, and use the meds for induction and neuromuscular blockade as we talked about. Choose your favorite, the one that's right for the patient, and know the side effect profile. So what can you do after the intubation? After the intubation, as soon as you're done, just elevate that head of the bed again. Don't forget about it, don't leave the patient there. Let's make sure that ICP does not increase. And make sure to sedate the patient, because your patient who is not sedated, especially if they're already paralyzed, their ICP is gonna keep going up, their blood pressure might go up, and it's gonna be a hot mess that you can avoid. So sedate your patients. And finally, make sure that the patient is monitored. When we say monitored, usually we're talking about blood pressure monitoring. Please don't have these vitals after you intubate your patient with a head injury because these look horrible. So make sure that they are frequent, have very clear instructions, so repeat them every 10 to 15 minutes, and have very clear goals with your team. So if your patient's blood pressure is too high or too low, it needs to be addressed. We need to make sure the patient's blood pressure is not too low because then if they're depending on collaterals to perfuse their brain, they can't do that anymore with blood pressures of 70 over 40. And finally, if your patient came in with seizures, or if you're concerned that they may develop seizures, if you have the ability to do an EEG, then start the process for that. In the majority of places, it takes hours for it to actually happen, if at all. But if that's something you can do, just start the process to make sure that if your patient is deteriorating while they're intubated, you are not missing that. And that is for after the intubation. Make sure to elevate the head of the bed, make sure to sedate them, and have very clear parameters for monitoring for blood pressure. And if you can do the EEG, let's do that. And this is my advice for the patient who you need to intubate. Just keep calm, intubate on, and make sure you have a plan for before, during, and after your intubation. And if you can avoid that intubation, then that needs to be what you need to do. Before the intubation, remember, you need to elevate the head of the bed, pre-oxygenate, and pre-medicate preferably with fentanyl. During, decrease the time so they don't become hypercarbic. Use the meds for induction and neuromuscular blockade. Ketamine, propofol, just a little vote here. And then afterwards, make sure to pull that head of the bed right up, sedate them, and monitor their blood pressure frequently with clear goals and possibly an EEG. And always ask yourself, do they really need to be intubated? Thank you for taking the time to listen to me, and I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you.